Hi everyone, this is Jackie Blanchard, Vice President of Infection Prevention for the Clinical Operations Group at HCA Healthcare. Today we're going to talk about mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, specifically contraindications, side effects, and reporting requirements. So we will go over three quick things, just briefly on the administration and background of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. And then we'll spend some time talking about the contraindications, precautions, and common side effects. I will round it up at the end uh, and talk to you all about the EUA fact sheet and our reporting mechanism to report any reactions. So there are currently two vaccines uh, that are authorized in the U.S. I'm sure you all know about these two vaccines. The first was authorized on December 12th by ASIP, December 12th, 2020. And that is Pfizer-BioNTech. It's been authorized for recipients 16 years of age and older. This is under the FDA's emergency use authorization. That vaccine has to be given three weeks apart or 21 days. Moderna is the second vaccine, and that was released on December 19th by ASIP. And that vaccine is for persons 18 years of age and older. And that vaccine has to be given one month or 28 days apart. Just some really quick public health recommendations for our vaccinated populations. Uh, once they become vaccinated, it's still very important to maintain infection prevention practices. The protection from the vaccine is not immediate. It is a two-dose series, as I just mentioned, and it'll take about one to two weeks following that second dose to be considered a fully vaccinated. And as you all know, no vaccine is 100% effective. And uh, given the current limited information about these vaccines and how they work in the general population, uh, including how it might reduce disease or transmission and how long that protection lasts, uh, we still encourage our vaccinated populations to continue following current guidance for infection prevention. That includes wearing masks, staying six feet apart from others, avoiding crowds, and washing your hands often. The reactogenicity, I just a little bit on this, but before vaccination, the providers should really talk to your recipients about the expected local and systemic post-vaccination symptoms and what they should uh, expect to be feeling afterwards. Unless a person develops a contraindication to the vaccine, they should be encouraged to complete the series, even if they develop post-vaccine symptoms. Uh, and this is in order to optimize protection against COVID-19. We are recommending any anaparetics or analgesic medications after the treatment of post-vaccine symptoms to treat some of the localized or systemic responses that uh, some of the recipients are having. But routine prophylaxis for the purpose of preventing symptoms is not recommended at this time. And this is due to the lack of info that we have on the impact of use on the vaccine-induced uh, antib antibody response. Again, to summarize, the administration, Pfizer is 17 to 21 days apart. Moderna is 24 to 28 days apart. And um, in terms of, of co-administration with other vaccines, no other vaccine should really be administered within 14 days, the series. Okay, so uh, try not to give routine vaccinations such as flu, pneumonia, shingles vaccine uh, until we've cleared the 14 days window after the series is over or uh, give it 14 days prior to starting the series. One other thing to note, a COVID-19 vaccine should not be given within 90 days of monoclonal antibody therapy. Vaccine manufacturers are not interchangeable at this time, so do not mix Pfizer with Moderna. For instance, if the recipient received Pfizer as dose one, they should not be getting Moderna as the second dose. Um, I, I know that some of the clinics may be running out of one over the other, but we really should wait until the same manufacturer is available for giving that same dose to the patient. Other typical vaccines, uh, such as flu, shingles, pneum, uh, pneumococcal vaccine, again, just watch for that timing and, and see if you can wait that 14-day window. There are extenuating circumstances where other vaccines may be co-administered, but again, this is this should be far and few between, 
and examples where the co-administration of other vaccines where the benefits may outweigh unknown risks of co-administration would be things such as a tetanus, toxoid, measles, or hep A vaccines in the middle of an outbreak. Okay, so again, the benefits of making sure that the recipient or the patient gets these other vaccines uh, would outweigh the risk of co-administration. So let's talk a little bit about the side effects. Most systemic post-vaccine symptoms are mild to moderate in severity, so, uh, and they occur within the first three days of vaccine and resolve within one to three days of the onset. These are things such as localized pain, swelling, great fevers, fatigue. So these are some of the things, again, that we want to counsel the patients on in terms of what to expect. These symptoms uh, tend to be more frequent and severe following the second dose and among younger persons compared to older persons. And when I say that, I mean uh, less than 55 for Pfizer, less than 65 for Moderna. So again, the younger population seem to have more frequent symptomology post-vaccine. Unless a person develops a contraindication to the vaccine, however, they should be encouraged to complete the series. And if they develop some of these low, mild, moderate symptoms, again, please encourage them to complete uh, the second dose. In terms of contraindications and precautions, it's rare that anaphylactic reactions and response have been reported, but they have been. And again, uh, because of the millions of vaccines that are ongoing right now, the FDA, the CDC are continuing their uh, ongoing investigations. With any person that has a history of an immediate allergic reaction to the first dose of an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine or any of its components, they should not come back for the second dose. And uh, this is important counsel uh, for the patients. In terms of, uh, just for, for the purpose of this guidance, an immediate allergic reaction to a vaccine or medication is defined as any hypersensitivity-related signs or symptoms such as urticaria, angioedema, respiratory distress, such as wheezing and strider, or anaphylaxis that occurs within four hours following administration. All uh, recipients of the vaccine should be observed for either 15 or 30 minutes, depending on that prior history. Here are the contraindications that's spelled out by the CDC. There are three that are listed out. The first is severe allergic reactions, such as anaphylaxis, after a previous dose of an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine or any of its components. The second is any immediate allergic reaction of any severity to a previous dose of an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine or any of its components, including polyethylene glycol or PEG or PEG. And the third is immediate allergic reaction of any severity to polysorbate. And this is due to potential cross-reactive hypersensitivity with the vaccine ingredient PEG. These persons should not receive mRNA COVID-19 vaccination at this time unless they've been evaluated uh, by an immunologist or their provider. There are a few things listed on the CDC that's neither a contraindication nor precaution to vaccination. Um, and here they are uh, just quickly any allergic reactions or history of allergic reactions, including severe allergic reactions that's not related to the mRNA vaccine or its components. So these are things such as uh, allergies to food, pets, environmental allergies, or allergies to oral medications. These are not contraindications or precautions to vaccinations with either mRNA uh, COVID-19 vaccines. The vial stoppers, of the vaccines are not made with natural rubber latex, and there's, there's no contraindication or precautions to vaccines for persons with a latex allergy uh, because of this. And lastly, as the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines don't contain eggs or gelatin, persons with these allergies do not have a contraindication or precaution to the vaccine. There's a great tool on the CDC website if you want to just look up algorithm for the triage of persons presenting for mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. It's a great tool and a visual where it color codes those who may proceed with the vaccine, those are, uh, who are precautioned to the vaccine, and the absolute in contraindications to the vaccine. So again, it's right on the CDC website, and uh, it does get updated regularly, so please go on the website and look for it. Again, it's called the Algorithm for the Triage of Persons 
presenting before mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. So again, very important to understand the differences between the contraindications uh, and normal history of allergies. All recipients should be observed for 15 minutes if no histories or indication and anyone with a previous history or anaphylactic response to a previous product or vaccine not related to mRNA should be observed for 30 minutes and that should also be in consultation with the PCP. To reiterate, the only contraindication to the vaccine would be an allergy or severe reaction or anaphylaxis to any components of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. Here are a few things that you should have at the clinic or at the site of vaccinations. Uh, these are the recommended meds and supplies for any vaccination site. So at all sites, you should have the following. The first is uh, an epinephrine pre-filled syringe or auto-injector. The second is an H1 antihistamine, such as uh, diphenhydramine. Third is a blood pressure cuff. Fourth is a stethoscope. And the fifth is a timing device to assess pulse. So those five things should be at all sites and available at all times. There are other products that we should have on hand, but if your clinic or your vaccination site is affiliated with or close to an emergency department or within a, an acute care facility, these other products should be on site as well. But when feasible, there's other products that you might also want to have on hand, such as a pulse ox, uh, O2, uh, bronchodilators, H2 antihistamines, IV fluids, intubation kits, and the uh, adult size pocket masks. All right, again, these are more for the codes and, and first response. So generally, if you're part of an acute care site, that would come with that code cart. But should anyone develop any anaphylaxis, as a, an immediate response, we should absolutely call 911 and, and give that epi auto injection to that patient. Again, call emergency response uh, for any anaphylaxis reactions. All right, let's round this up with uh, what we should do uh, with this information, how to report it. And this is really important for the investigation purposes and also to keep track of the vaccines themselves and where these side effects are occurring. So we talked about the EUA. There's also an EUA fact sheet. And this fact sheet should be given to the patient or to the recipient prior to coming to the vaccination site or prior to their vaccine or injection, even if they get the EUA fact sheet at the site. It's filled with great information for the patients or that recipient, including what to expect, the common side effects, when to call their provider, where to report these signs and symptoms. So again, very important, great information uh, for the recipient to have on hand uh, and also gives them an idea of what to expect post-vaccination. If any of the recipients develop side effects or a reaction, they should contact the clinic where they received the vaccine. And we as providers, we do need to report adverse events or anaphylaxis events to VAERS, uh, which is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. And it is off the FDA uh, slash CDC website. This is where we do need to report all of these events, um, again, as part of the investigation. And in addition to this, the patients also have the capability as an option uh, to use uh, the VSAF reporting uh, mechanism, and that can be used on their smartphone, in addition to a 1-800 or 1-866 number where they can contact Pfizer or Moderna directly. Again, all of this information is right on that EUA fact sheet that needs to be given to the patient prior to them getting vaccinated, all right? It's protection for the patient, it's protection for us as providers and vaccinators, uh, so it's really important and smart uh, to, to make sure that they receive that. Okay, well, I hope that this was helpful, and thank you so much for your time, and we will talk next time. Thank you very much.